slide shows that you um, clearly have some concerns about what's been going on, um, either from a flyer that you read or the newspaper um, or somebody else that's been talking to you about the issue. And um, we're here also because there are, because we have similar concerns and um, that were raised uh, based on these allegations. And there's a lot of questions that we still have and things that we know and things that we don't know. But those concerns are, and those questions and the allegations we feel are uh, important enough to start asking more questions and trying to get more clarification about what's going on from Vanderbilt. Um, because these are some like, pretty serious allegations and the, kind of the lack of transparency and accountability, um, which are two very important things that have been missing, um, have kind of created these concerns. Um, so I want to thank you all for being here. And we're going to start with uh, PowerPoint. And then at 8.30, we have uh, somebody Skyping in uh, from the Oakland Institute. And then we're going to have a Q&A at the end of it. Um, and we'd love to hear all, hear all of your questions and have a, an open discussion about what you guys think. So the first thing that I wanted to ask all of you is what is a land grab? And um, you can raise your hand if you just have any kind of ideas or thoughts that come to mind. And uh, we'll jot down some notes just to kind of get a sense of what people uh, know or don't know or things that it makes them think of. Yeah. Um, I think from what I get, it's like uh, taking available land um, and using it for whatever purpose, but being able to take that land it's maybe because it's cheaper or um, it's easily accessible, and then using that land, whether it's in one's country or not, and then exporting whatever you use the land for. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I think it's investing into uh, other countries um, with under the under like an image of helping build, uh, create jobs and infrastructure and agriculture, but uh, those aren't always that doesn't always happen. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, when I heard the term, the term land grab, I sort of get the same sense of urgency as like with the gold rush. So something just like where it's a mass rush to get as much as you can in a short period of time. All right, and we'll get started with the PowerPoint. So I want to make clear that the people who will be presenting tonight are part of a coalition of students that are um, trying to find out more about this issue and trying to share information. That's not to say that everyone in this room is in the same position. We're all in a coalition together. Um, so we want to encourage everyone strongly to share your concerns, share your questions, and make this as collaborative as possible. So in June, um, the Oakland Institute published a report with allegations that Vanderbilt, Harvard, and Spelman, among other universities, were investing in this company, Emerging Asset Management, and, uh, and that these companies were buying up uh, large tracts of land in countries in Southern Africa. Um, and then the day after The Guardian came out with uh, this article, um, that talked about it and and mentioned Vanderbilt. And that kind of got it in the public media and got people talking about it. So that's kind of where it all started and where kind of the beginning of this, these questions started coming and where this campaign um, started. All right, I'm gonna cover this part. My name is Tristan. Um, and talk about what, what a land grab is from the perspective of those of us that have been um, trying to figure out a particular company. Um, 
Um, so you, you start with uh, the buyer. This has been something that's been sometimes a little unclear in the reporting on this particular case. Vanderbilt, for example, is not directly purchasing land. That's not usually how it works at this stage um, of, uh, of agricultural investment. So usually, at, at, at this point, um, some of the, the big players in buying up land, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, are hedge funds, which is a little bit surprising um, because typically hedge funds make their money off of other kinds of things, right? I mean, like a, a sort of recent and uh, um, public example would be the uh, mortgage derivatives that crashed the, 2000, uh, the, the housing market in 2008. Like that's the sort of thing that typically um, people, uh, hedge funds, put their money into. Agric agriculture is something that hedge funds haven't been really putting money into for a long time, but they're starting to now. Um, let me go to the next one. So emergent asset management is the company that, um, that Vanderbilt is currently invested in. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, it was founded by former managers at Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan, so big brokerage houses. Um, and the, um, David Murren, who is the CEO of Emergent Asset Management, wrote a book called Breaking the Code of History. It, it makes it easy to research people when they write books. Um, so we know a little bit about his strategy, which is basically he sees this looming confrontation between the West and China, um, which he thinks is going to lead to a, a land race in Africa because it's cheaper land than other places, and also because it's between the two. Um, and, he, and his strategy is because there's so much food insecurity there, because the food prices have gone up so much, Ari's going to talk about this later, um, because there's so much demand for food and higher prices, um, and also because of this looming armed confrontation, there's going to be a lot of money to be made. Um, so his strategy is to try to figure out how to cash in as much as possible on that confrontation. Um, and, and so, I mean, the Africa specifically, he talks about, um, as, uh, th and this company is targeted as being the emerging asset, the emerging market in land, both because land is cheap and because uh, they use phrases like, there's a population keen to work. Um, essentially, people are desperate there. Right? Um, and so it's, it's, it's been on the radar for that particular reason. They've been very sort of open about that. Um, so one of the things that's really important to note about this is um, sometimes the, the discussion gets about what kind of farming happens before or after a land grab. That's really important um, because it's often a shift between subsistence farming and export or industrial farming. But um, we want to highlight this company is not buying land to grow food. They, are, they do farming operations, because once you've got land, you can make some money off of that. But they've been very clear that in sub-Saharan Africa, the cost of agricultural land is currently low, and they think it's going to go up. And their objective is to get the land in their possession early on, because they think there's gonna, they're, they're hoping to start a land race there, basically. Um, and then once that, that land rises in value, they're going to try to flip it as fast as they can. So that's why they feel like they can guarantee 25% annual returns, which is a huge number. If, if you work in investing 25%, that's a golden number, right? And that's how they're thinking they can make it. So that alone is an arbitrage opportunity. Arbitrage basically means you know more than other people, and so you can play the differences between two markets really well um, and sort of manipulate your position. Um, that alone is an arbitrage opportunity, and we could be moronic and not grow anything, and we think we'll make money over the next decade. That's a quote from their CEO, Susan Payne. Um, so, keep going. Um, the seller. Um, this is something we're still trying to get more, and more information about, to be honest. But basically, um, usually when we're talking about land grabs, we're talking about um, land transfers that are not totally free and, and informed and voluntary, right? So in a lot of cases, especially in some of these countries in Africa, land is vested in the state. You can't actually sell it to foreign corporations. So they do 99-year leases instead, which you can imagine is basically the same thing. But these are often deals directly with the central state, um, so that the communities involved don't necessarily get the kind of informed consent that you might anticipate would, would actually be necessary for a free market to exist. Oh, and, and, and the state also, of course, gives um, all sorts of tax breaks. I was reading the, the, the details of the agreement today, and they, um, for, until 2015, they get an 80% discount on all taxes, this company. So, I mean, not only do they come in and take local land, but they actually don't pay back in to the national economy either. Um, the, and then, of course, there's the residents that previously used that land um, and who are dependent on it 
um, in, in a lot of cases, these, these lands are um, priced low because they're not, they haven't been on the market for a while. They're priced low because they're being used by local people to feed themselves. They're not in the agri agribusiness market already. Um, and so when those lands get taken over, the people that were using them then no longer have that to feed themselves. Um, so I think we're a little short on time, so I'll, I'll be really quick on this. The Matuba case, which we think might be where Vanderbilt is invested, though they've been very sort of avoidant about actually giving us any information. For example, 17 permanent jobs were created um, and 85 seasonal jobs on 2,000 hectares of land. So a large community of which 17 then get employment. So a lot of the time you hear land grabs being justified as we're creating employment, right? This is how colonialism has been justified for a long, long time, right? And this is the same thing that companies in South Africa were saying um, yeah, under apartheid. We're creating employment, we're giving people jobs in the diamond mines and so on, right? And there's of course a lot of truth to that, that they do create employment, but, but what we lose is the livelihoods that were erased and then the little bit of employment that was then added. Hi everybody, I'm Courtney. I have the next two slides. Uh, the first one here is regarding um, the response of an organization called the Union Nacional de Campaneses, which would be the National Union of Peasants, UNACI is what we'll call it for short, that works in Mozambique. And they're working together with an organization called Justice Ambiental, JA, they call it for short, which means already in now in uh, Portuguese. They are concerned with land grabs, which they define as the new tendency of foreign investors to monopolize the land and resources of other countries where people will have even more difficulty in feeding themselves. And they see land grabbing in Mozambique as a human rights issue where uh, they consider the right to food and an adequate standard of living, including access to resources. Water is a really big deal also. It's not just land, but water. The right to work, uh, information, and public participation. Within this idea of um, land grabbing as a human rights issue, they're concerned about food sovereignty, which is the right of people to use the land to produce food for themselves and to live off of. And, um, and community participation, not only in the decision of whether or not to bring uh, these companies from the outside, but uh, for conflict resolution and decision making. They're working also, they've done some projects that we've been reading over the reports, they're interesting. They give a more formal name for land grabbing as well that we can, we can, we can look at as well. It's called usurpation, which refers to the action of crafty or violent appropriation of something which is legitimately owned by someone else and is therefore taken without right, acquired by fraud, or illegally possessed. The term is also used to describe the global phenomenon of land grabbing, such as the rent or purchase of vast extensions of land in poor developing countries by richer countries with food insecurity of their own, and by private investors in the same countries in order to produce or explore diverse goods to export. All right, these are my slides. My name's Ari. And so I know that all of us are in this room today as parts of the Vanderbilt community because this is an issue that affects our endowment and thus we're concerned about it. But for a minute, I just want to move the issue to what's happening in Africa with the people that are being affected by these land grabs. So Tristan ran through the anatomy of a land grab um, and this is what one farmer said about it in that there's no prior um, there's no prior commitment of these people to agree to such a land acquisition. There's no process that gives them the right to appeal it. Uh, and it really is as if bulldozers show up one day and take their land. Now, a show of hands, how many of you knew that there was a monumental food crisis across the world in 2008? So this is something that a lot of people, I'm glad that most people in this room are educated about it. A lot of people didn't realize because here in America, maybe your burger at a fast food restaurant went up by three cents. But for many, especially in Southern Africa, this was the difference between feeding their families and not. And so when a, a land acquisition happens and a hedge fund like Emergent Asset Management changes a plot of land from subsistence farming to industrial agriculture, that's affecting these people because even if it did give them jobs, they're now earning a market wage 
and asked to pay for food that has dramatically risen in price instead of farming for themselves. So at a time when people are hurting for food and not able to pay for it, when that's a dire situation, this is taking away food from the people that have used this land for that reason for generations. Another concern that parallels food is water. Part of these deals, Emergent gets almost exclusive access to the water on the land, and they use that if they're farming for um, irrigation, and they're at total liberty to do what they want with that water. So this takes the water from the hands of the people who live there, who sometimes have severe droughts and shortages, and, uh, and gives it for the profit of the company. These are the slides from Katie, who's sick and can't be here tonight, so I'll cover. Um, one thing to, to keep in mind is that those of us in this room are some of literally billions of people that are talking about this issue right now in, in the world, right? Um, the largest social movement in the world, La Via Campesina, um, has um, mem member organizations in about 80 countries. It's the small farmers unions from all these countries around the world that got together um, and came up with that idea of food sovereignty that Courtney was talking about. Um, their main campaign globally right now is against land grabs because as soon as this food crisis in 2008 happened, suddenly it became incredibly lucrative again to start grabbing land up um, in, in order to sell it again or to produce food, right? Um, because people are more and more desperate and the prices obviously doubled, right? Um, and so the resistance to that um, from La Vie Campesina um, has been primarily education and the request that their allies elsewhere in the world do education work around what's happening with land grabs and to help end them, which is one of the reasons that we're here today. Um, one of the things that the, the um, actually this is originally from the UN, I think it's a really uh, important point, is that land grabs are what they call development in reverse, right? Think about development as being, you know, People getting more money or more more food security, having more control over their lives, um, more stuff. Uh, this is the opposite, right? The food crisis wiped out 10 years of international development around the world because it, it the, the level of desperation in so many places skyrocketed as soon as those food prices did. Um, you want to go to the next one? And really quick regarding that, the, um, that the um, what we're seeing here with 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 these, uh, the acquiring of land by hedge funds um, is at about the worst moment you could imagine. And that's really what I want to emphasize here, is as a result of that, and because this is happening in so many places around the world, this is happening in South America, this is happening in Southeast Asia, this is happening in Central Asia, this is happening all over the place, there are enormous social movements that are rising up right now to challenge it. And that's one of the things that we wanted to bring to the room. Hi, I'm Zach. Um, I'm a sophomore in arts and sciences, and uh, I'm going to be talking about what Vanderbilt's uh, response to our inquiries and other people's inquiries has been. Um, the first thing that happened is right after the Guardian uh, published this article uh, quoting the Oakland Institute information, uh, Leslie Gill, the chair of the anthropology department, drafted a letter, and uh, something like 80 faculty and uh, graduate students and students here and at other universities uh, signed the letter and they sent it to the uh, Vice Chancellor uh, Matthew Wright who is uh, at, who's the Vice Chancellor of Investment here. So he leads a team of about 15 people that uh, manage our investments and our associations with hedge funds at Vanderbilt for our endowment. Uh, they sent this letter uh, expressing their concern and asking for more information and what they got back was a, conf a letter marked confidential sent to Leslie Gill. So that has been the extent of their response. It hasn't been public. Uh, it's, it was marked confidential. So currently Vanderbilt's refused essentially to talk about this. Um, <laughs> in meetings with Matthew Wright, he said things like, uh, the social benefits are not our number one priority when asked why we're, we're possibly invested in companies that were abusing human rights in other countries. Um, and additionally, uh, uh, so um, our group, uh, Vanity Campaign for Fair Food, uh, had a meeting with Provost McCarthy 
Uh, it was fr with people from uh, all different uh, sections of Vanderbilt, including graduate students, uh, students here. And um, what he told us was essentially that he trusted Matthew Wright, and that was the extent of what yeah. our ethical guidelines here is that we hired someone trusted that ethical guidelines would be redundant, that our involvement in questioning if the actions they've taken and the investing they do is inappropriate. And uh, he really <coughs> said that there is no need for any change in the system that we have, and that <laughs> and what, what he, his response is, uh, what is the acceptable failure rate for our ethics? Is actually exactly what he said. So I don't know the exact answer to that question, but I'm pretty sure I don't agree with him on it. <laughs> so we view this as a chance to get it right. Uh, there's been two cases that we're going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> ben, do you want to hold off? Uh, we're scheduled at 8.30 to, to have a Skype call with the director of the Oakland Institute, which is the organization that did much of the research on the ground in Southern Africa that provided uh, a source for the Garden Ar Guardian article and for much of our investigation. So I um, just want to introduce her, and we're going to try to Skype with her right now. What she's going to do, her name is Adarada Mital, and she's going to talk for about five or six, seven minutes about the investigation that she did and how they linked it to Vanderbilt. And then we'll have some time for questions for everybody to ask her, followed by after this presentation another question and answer session. But she's going to be on the, on the phone for about 15 minutes. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi. <laughs> we're here with looks like 50, about 50 students and other people at Vanderbilt. And so we were hoping that you could tell us about the investigation of emergent asset management, and then for about six <laughs> minutes or so, and then people I'm sure would love to ask you some questions. Sure. Um, first of all, um, I, I don't even know how to say thank you. Uh, thank you all for um, being here this evening, and I know it's late for you folks. So let's see, I'm going to just say um, a little bit about uh, overall land grabs and our work, and then talk about emergent. Is that OK? Um, for us uh, at the Institute, uh, we, um, ha we are a policy think tank that works around issues of food security and development and all of that. And in 2008, we were noticing the food crisis that started you know, increasing. There was almost an 83% increase between food prices in 2007 and 2008. And while we were kind of studying the impact of that, we were asked by UNCAD and other UN agencies to do research around that phenomenon. Uh, we also started seeing the financial crisis and this whole new uh, need for investors to look for soft commodity markets where they could be invested in. So these two things were happening at the same time. And that's when the refer reports of these massive land grabs, as the phenomenon came to be known as, uh, started appearing, whether it was front page of uh, the Guardian newspaper or the New York Times. So the way it was originally spun was um, rich but food insecure countries, Gulf states, China, which are going to face food shortages, are going into poor nations, African countries, to ensure their food supply. And initially we saw concern expressed by the UN, you know, Food and Agriculture Organization, IFAD, and very soon we saw the World Bank move in and talk about how it could be a win-win situation. You know, a lot of development agencies started talking about how you could make it uh, with, you know, socially responsible investments a good thing where food insecure countries could have access to food resources and cash-strapped countries, say in Africa, could have a steady source of income. And for us at the Institute, we were a little bit puzzled by it because everyone was making a few <coughs> assumption. One was, for instance, that large-scale industrial agriculture will fix the problem as if the problem is just one of demand and supply. Two, everyone kept talking about available land. And it was like Africa is a continent. And do we have figures for each country? Do we know what the realities are in terms of land titles and availability of land? 
Where do uh, communal lands fit in? Where do, say, the rights of pastoralists in Tanzania fit in? So with all those questions that we felt were still like the big knowledge gaps, we started this project for understanding land investments in Africa. Also, I should say at the Institute, we are not against investment. We recognize through our work that we have done around food insecurity that one big cause of growing hunger in the world is that developing countries where most of the people are involved in agriculture have been told over the last 20, 30 years not to invest in agriculture. But so the question is not just of investment, but it's really one of what kind of investment. You know, just by putting money down is not going to lead to uh, job creation or improved, you know, food production. So with all those things in mind, we were a trying to understand land grabs. Second, we also wanted to kind of answer what kind of investment is needed and how do we promote that kind of investment. Uh, we are a reputable institution. Um, a lot of philanthropic organizations are asking us where we should be putting money from high net worth individuals. So we also wanted to see what works, not just what doesn't work. So in the course of that work, we basically started coming across some very egregious stories, things that we uh, had not expected, if we put it this way, that we felt with the kind of information we had, we had to let the world know. And I'm going to just share, and that's how emergent fits in. One is, um, uh, just quick findings that we have is that the pace at which this trend is happening, just in the last couple of years, over 70 million hectares of land have been bought or leased, predominantly in Africa, 70% or more is in Africa. To, as we started researching, we found that there's no information. You know, you can't walk into a ministry or you can't talk to an investor and say, can I see your title? Can I see your land deed? Can I see the process you went through? to speak to communities. So the lack of transparency was really shocking, that how do you make it a win-win when people who are being impacted, the information is not there. And uh, so in the course of that research, I was in Geneva last November, where an ag investment conference was being organized by HighQuest partners who are based in Boston and St. Louis. Um, and that's where I got to meet with uh, um, with the Susan Payne, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Emergent. It was very interesting. It was a two-day conference, you know, how to invest in land in Eastern Europe, how to invest in land in Latin America. And then there was a session on Africa. And actually, there's the first time I heard socially responsible investment, because there's been so much pressure around that lands in African countries are being taken over, that they at least feel the need to start the presentations with socially responsible investment. Susan Crane, who I've been following because she has been speaking at many conferences, talks a lot about socially responsible investment. Um, she made her presentation. It was very interesting. At the same time, we talk about socially responsible investment, high returns, promising 25 to 40% returns, and then also saying we could be moronic and not grow food, and we would make high returns. This is for investors, and you are like, how do you make high returns in agriculture? Because if you look at United States, returns in the last 15, 20 years have been at most 5 to 6 percent. So what is so magical about Africa that you make these high returns? Which led to many conversations starting in Geneva to going on um, an investor trip. Uh, in uh, December, I accompanied her, uh, the chief investment officer of Emergent, David Murren, and some other people along with other potential investors from uh, the likes of JP Morgan and etc. We flew in private plane from uh, Johannesburg to the uh, <coughs> port of Zambia, Mozambique, Swaziland, and South Africa in like three days because we had private planes and private helicopters. In that trip, you just drop from the skies, you land, you know, you see this big circular plantations, you land there, um, you see abundance of green land, abundance of water, you are told you have complete water rights, it's a great project, you're going to do it. And you don't really see the people other than when your helicopter descends and people come running and you're wondering who are these people, right? Uh, didn't really get to interact with people, but did get hold of, you know, get to spend time with emergent folks, um, including when we were in Mozambique in Matuba project. Their farm manager, for instance, um, you know, asking him about, well, are you where do you get the land from? They said this is a greenfield project. 
Greenfield means you have not paid anything for it. The government has given it to you for agricultural development. They have complete water rights. Asking them, are you hiring local people? Because there is this vibrant village, um, community of 7,000 people, to which um, Peter, their farm manager, says, well, it's not very politically correct to say, but I can say to you, look at these people. They're all criminals, potential criminals. Um, you know, so it was not really interacting with the community, but just taking it all in, um, going, you know, I was pointed out an orphanage, I was pointed out that bore well that they said that they have done for the community. Um, saw the electric lines that have come, and by the way, I'm, the village that I'm talking about are these circular huts, um, you know, poverty, talk about the way you imagine poverty in Africa no electricity, they have brought in electricity lines, and I remember asking David Murren that you took this land from the community, um, and at that time they were saying they had 2,000 hectares of land just in that area, um, and you know, you have complete water rights, you don't have to pay by the amount of water you use, are you going to give electricity, bring electricity line to the village? Um, it was interesting for a chief investment officer who has gotten water for free, who has gotten land for free, says, oh, we don't want to create a moral hazard for these villagers by bringing electricity lines. You know, they need to work and pay for it. Anyway, there were just a lot of red flags and looking at the documents, which were looking at the <coughs> business plan, where, uh, you know, they have strategic investor status, they don't have to pay profit taxes, they can repatriate their profits, they have registered their fund in, um, you know, from Luxembourg to uh, Mauritius for taxation purposes. Uh, you start wondering what are the benefits for the country of Mozambique, and you say perhaps their jobs and the business plan, as you can find on the website, clearly says 18 in the first year, 18 jobs, permanent jobs, one eight. This is a village of 7,000 people. Now, if you've done any kind of work around agriculture and agroecology, you know, in Africa, uh, if you have one to two hectares of arable land, that can sustain a family. So even if you talk about 2,000 hectares, you can do the maths and figure out how many people were surviving on that land, and you think of 18 jobs. It was just a lot of problems. So come February, I went back. And I have got, I mean, we have done research in seven different countries, looked at different land deals, over 50 land deals. So I'm just talking about emergent. So going back to the community was very interesting. This time I didn't drop from the skies. I drove. It was uh, 400 kilometers uh, from uh, Maputo. And um, driving down, it's fascinating, right from Maputo, capital of Mozambique, going down to Chakwe district, where Matuba village is, all next to the freeway, you see crops growing. So talk about availability of land. There are people, I mean, right next to each other. These are really tightly knit villages, right? It's not like, oh, areas of land where nobody's living. Even the side of the freeway, they're growing their corn. After every five minutes or so, you come across a community village. You see a community market. You know, you see all these people who have brought their produce and they're selling it to each other. And so it's kind of shocking when you keep thinking of like, well, there's all this land. So finally got to Matuba village. I was accompanied by Diamantino Namposa, who is the executive director of UNA. UNA is Mozambique's largest farmers organization. Um, they have the unions there, but this village is so poor that it is not a part of the union because the people, the subsistence farmers, could not afford to pay the dues, so he had never been there. So we met with the farmers. Uh, we had to hide in the sugarcane fields, and we met with them. And uh, you know, these were open-ended questions because Emergent is there right next to them, Sainsbury, which is um, from UK. They, Mia has set up its operations. Talk to them about the experience with these new neighbors. The experience, well, this is the land after the Civil War ended, we have been here. But because of the history, which is all over Africa, because of the colonial history, communal lands, people's lands, you know, the areas that pastoralists might use, they're all considered state lands. So the state can create a legal process by which you might have farmed and lived on the land for decades of a generations, but suddenly the lease can happen and a foreign investor moved in. So they told me first about Mia, which has nothing to do with Emergent, but is also UK based, that one day they showed up with bulldozers and told the community, oh, we now own this land. And they said, but we are growing our food on it. 
we can't move. And the women farmers reported how they flew planes dropping something which burned the standing crop. Then I said, hey, what's your experience with emergent? And they said, for that, let's go to the village of Matuba. So, and I was also accompanied by um, a, a colleague who works with a big foundation um, and, uh, and with Diamantino, we went into Machuba village, we got to meet with the chief and we had a meeting. From what I learned over there, on one hand there is a legal process where in Mozambique, um, for foreign investors, they are told what areas are available. They're supposed to go to the community and the community has to agree to give the land. So I asked this community that, you know, emergent has 2,000 hectares, how do you feel about it? And you gave them permission, are you happy? This is what they had to say. One was, they talked about the power dynamics, that this is absolute, you know, living in abysmal poverty where they have never seen the district officials. And one day a whole barrage of cars with flashing lights drives into their village, by the way, which has no road, you know, the dirt ends outside, so they all come in where the district official, Mr. Mugabe, is impressing upon them that, look, these are people who have come from outside to help you and end your poverty. So they're going to ask you to sign, and you need to sign. Now, you have to understand the power dynamics of people who are not being to school, who are living in poverty. They, have, they, are, you know, they, they, they live on the basis of what they grow and from the cattle that they graze. That's what they depend on. So suddenly a lot of pressure from government you need to sign. There's a white man, Peter, who's saying, I'm here to end your poverty. They're not given any paperwork. They've not done anything. They sign, and then suddenly they are told that the 1,000 hectares are gone. They still do not have a copy of the land lease. I had brought copy of the Duat. That's what it's called in Mozambique, the land lease, and I gave it to them. They had never seen it, though it is their land. Two, I asked them that the investor says they have 2,000 hectares to which they basically said, we're getting a lot of pressure, but there's no way we can give that additional hectares. Already, we are in hunger season. They showed, they, I met with families whose plots of land were in the area that Emergent has taken, and they have no land to grow their food. They were in hunger season, and they were like, we need the extra thousand for our children and for our cattle to graze. We cannot give this away. We're getting a lot of pressure. So on one hand, you could say, yes, it is legal, because they were asked to sign, and they signed. But I could also say apartheid, it was legal, right? So what is legal? Uh, the, um, so that's one thing. Secondly, what really fuels this? As we try to understand, and Emergent was trying to make a case as to why they're credible. The way they gain credibility to other investors is talked about US universities. They breached their contract with Harvard University. And from what I'm told, though Harvard has not said it, that Harvard, because of breach of confidentiality, has pulled out its funds from Emergent. <laughs> because Harvard University did not want them to tell the world that they invested in them. And uh, they were, in fact, the cornerstone investors. And then they said, well, and Vanderbilt. In case of Harvard University, they said, I could not talk to anyone because they have a confidentiality contract. But in case of Vanderbilt, they said you should speak to the chief investment officer, Matthew Wright, who is willing to be a reference. So I had a phone conversation with Mr. Wright, um, and I asked him about um, Emergent, and he had heard about them through Wall Street Journal, that his job was to get high returns. I asked him if uh, they had done any diligence on their claims of socially responsible investment. To which Mr. Matthew Wright had this to say that, you know, it is nice to know that they're doing SRI, socially responsible investment, he has heard about it, um, and that's nice, but his primary goal is to secure high returns on the investment and not socially responsible investment. And personally, it's a little bit shocking because it is not Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan that you're talking to. You're talking to um, a vice chancellor for investments of a reputable institution where endowments are being invested, which you hope due diligence would have been done. He said due diligence was done on the data room stuff, which is the financial figures. However, the, um, diligence had not been done for, um, um, on the SRI, because that was not their primary concern. Um, I also asked him about any feedback he would have for me, and he said, well, I should look for funds that are uh, uh, registered in places like Cayman Islands or um, Mauritius, 
because the Luxembourg is good, it still has a European hangover. So it is better when you can go to third world countries um, that can provide you tax havens. So I guess <coughs> tax advice. <laughs> um, Anuradha, um, can we uh, ask you some questions now? Thank you so much for what you said, but I think we'd like to open it up. Sure. And ask some questions. So we're going to hand around a microphone. Can you hear me right now? I can hear you perfect. Uh, we'll, we can try without a microphone okay. first. So, can anyone ask questions? Yeah. Um, I have a question. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Okay, great. Um, before you, before we entered in a Skype with you, we talked about the dangers of growing biofuels in lands that, on land that should be used to grow crops. Does emergent assets management growing biofuels on land that they're developing? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, in case of uh, emergent, by the way, if I could just complete a couple of things on emergent, I don't know if you know that emergent has completely imploded. They were supposed to be $540 million strong fund, though they claim to be the largest agricultural fund in Africa. It's, it's a myth. $500 million was supposed to come over a period of time from Harvard, and if Harvard has put it up, they have imploded. I le later learned David Murren and Susan Payne are a couple that they have split, and they've also split emergent. So I hope the endowment of Vanderbilt is safe. Otherwise, if some of you are on scholarship through that endowment, you are in deep doo doo. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, no, it, it's actually not funny, but that's actually true, uh, which is a kind of this, the risk investments that endowments would make to jeopardize uh, universities. Secondly, um, Emergent has different operations within Mozambique itself. They have one aquaculture project. They have one Jetropa project for agrofuels. Matuba that I actually visited, they are growing food uh, for exports. Uh, they are planting, they plant, they're setting up a tomato paste factory right there. So they're growing tomatoes. It's all done through irrigation. They've brought in like 40 year old technology from the US, which is all through pivots. And they're right next to a canal, so they have imposed first water rights that are stealing water from the canal to use it on the fields. So on one hand, you could say, yes, it's not agrofuel, it's tomato paste, tomatoes for tomato paste. But in terms of the livelihoods of the people who were there, their access to water, they have destroyed it. Two, the impact of, these are like virgin lands where no pesticides and the rest have been used. So the impact of using all that through irrigation in those fields without concern for downstream users, that's, that has a huge impact and conservation issues in Mozambique and its water resources. But Matuba itself is not for agrofuels. It's for growing uh, tomatoes and um, whatever. Uh, and in Zambia, for instance, their project is for, it's a banana plantation. So we have time for about two more questions or three more questions. Does anyone else have a question? Yeah, in the back, Kyle. Hi, Inarada. It's Kyle Blaine. We spoke over the phone earlier this semester, and I uh, wrote the story for The Hustler. Um, can you hear me all right? I can hear you just fine. I just don't see you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think I might be out of, yeah. I'll walk in so you can see. Okay. Thank you. It's uh, <laughs> uh, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about Harvard's divestments, what kind of, um, what factual information you have and related to, yeah. how, you know, how sure are you that Harvard has divested? Um, you know, Harvard, like a lot of universities, um, uh, has a policy of not saying. So they never said they are invested or they're not invested. Um, Emergent initially, when they were contacted, had told the Guardian, uh, based on Guardian had seen our information and emails and stuff, and they had said, yes, you know, these universities are invested in us. After that, there was an uh, interview in Business Insider where Emergent spokesperson said that Harvard is currently not invested. I was just last week at Harvard University speaking where uh, TELUS Institute, T-E-L-L-U-S, they kind of do a lot of work around kind of monitoring uh, endowments, university endowments, and where they're investing and what kind of funds. They basically again said that though Harvard would not confirm because it's just their policy, uh, 
that it was not money that they had already put in, it was supposed to be put in over a period of time, which I had been told before, and that because of the breach of the contract, Harvard would be really pissed and they would have taken the money out. And looking at what's happening to Emergent, the way it has kind of separated and all of that, they're not going to do Emergent Asset Management, will not be doing agriculture apparently, they're going to mining and war machine, which David Murren's big issue is. Um, yeah, I don't know what they're doing with that. So we don't have evidence, but that's what emergent spokespeople have told media. Can I ask a quick follow-up slash not, not really follow-up? All right, I, I, I have a separate question, but it's <laughs> definitely related. I, I spoke with the provost um, yesterday, and he told me that he understands that there are bad things happening in Africa, uh, but he also said that there were there were positive things happening. Um, based on your experience, based on your research, can you speak to anything, any sort of positive things happening in Africa as a result of investment? Um, and is it more of a pro-con that you have to weigh, or is it mostly a con? Because I guess the impression that we get is that all these bad things are happening. So. Well, uh, definitely there's a lot of very exciting stuff happening in Africa, um, you know, and as around the world in terms of um, um, you know, communities and then and in terms of what really needs to happen, there's some great microfinance schemes. I think the issue when it comes to agricultural investment is you have to question what the purpose of the investment is. If it is to benefit African countries, to benefit the livelihoods of the smallholders who form the majority of the agrarian base, there are some great programs that are happening. In fact, we have just put together uh, about 30 different cases of uh, where if your goals are to increase production, to uh, improve livelihoods of farmers, to improve gender uh, you know, related issues within African countries, we look at 30 cases and what has worked and how they work. But in terms of finding funds, what we are finding is that you know, people that have nothing to do with agriculture, you know, pension funds, university endowments, um, Emergent, if you look at the, the background of the, these were fund managers, they don't know ABCD of agriculture. When they are going into Africa, the way, the reason they're going is, for instance, the land you're getting for free or you're able to lease out for a 99 year lease for, you know, free or for 53 cents per acre is the quality of land for which you would pay $18,000 per hectare in, in, in a corn belt in the, in the Midwest or you would pay $26,000, $28,000 in England. So I think the question that really comes is if you're asking, do you find an investment where a pension fund or a university endowment is invested, if that's a good one, I'm sorry, I don't have a yes answer for you. Okay. Because that is being driven by higher returns, and higher returns means that somebody gets poor. And usually it is the, you know, the local economies, national economies, which are bending over backwards to you know, which are being told to bend over backwards to invite foreign investors and the communities who don't have, you know, the Western concept of private property. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anurada. I think that's all the time okay. we have for right now, but thanks again for Skyping yes. and sharing this. Yeah. Oh, is there, we have another one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I know that Imagines is doing something that's like an ethical by investing, but what about the government, since they're the ones who actually... Um, sorry, I didn't hear this, I'm sorry. Okay, Can you so, that okay, yeah, so Imagines is obviously doing like an ethical investment in Africa, but what about the African governments that are actually like kicking the people out of their farms? What about that? What can we, like, what's up with that? Is there like, Thank should we like tell you the government instead? No, that's a very good question and I appreciate you asking that. Um, you know, definitely. I mean, you know, what we have found in our research is very complex. It's not just, you know, on one hand you have the investors, but you also, we are looking at the way for them to come into African nations has really been paved by, you know, for instance, the World Bank Group. I mean, you start looking at Mozambique, where you have an uh, investment agency called CPI, or you go to Zambia, you have Zambia Development Agency, or you go to Tanzania, you have Tanzania Investment Center. These are all one-stop shops. I mean, you look at their websites, they mandate in different languages, but reads the same. They have been prepared by you know, the World Bank Group, the International Finance Corporation. So in the last 20 years, it used to be, hey, you're a poor nation, you grow coffee, you grow cocoa, you grow a cash crop. 
And now it is, okay, why you're growing all that, throwing the land and the cheap labor too. So it's a whole development paradigm. And then yes, you have a lot of international pressure, but you also have the local elites, national elites. We are looking at land deals in Tanzania, the largest land deal that we exposed in June involves a US investor and, uh, and involves the Prime Minister of Tanzania, involves uh, you know, the previous Minister of Interior who would have been responsible for refugee affairs, who is now a legal advisor to this company and he's basically did a land deal where the people, over 160,000 refugees, are going to be kicked out. So it is definitely working together uh, the political and economic elites in these countries. But as a US-based group, we feel that what we have to do is to go after our institutions, our power structures. Because in our work, what we have also seen is this incredible struggle and the fight that the communities are putting up. In case of Tanzania, we are seeing the local community that is going to be displaced, that of refugees who have lived there for 40 years, they're fighting back. In case of South Sudan, we, um, you know, in June announced, uh, you know, released the biggest, one of the largest land deeds in South Sudan, which was negotiated in 2008, and the people didn't know about it. And once they learned about it, they have basically gone and told the president, we see those white folks around there, we're going to lynch them, because we fought with Khartoum for 50 years, so the land could belong to community. Um, in uh, Senegal recently, we lost two of our colleagues who were in a clash uh, lost their lives. Or in Sierra Leone, we are seeing grassroots communities who are not doing radio programs to educate paramount chiefs that don't just trust people who come in and say we are here to end your poverty and who come with local elites and district officers. So uh, we feel like we can strengthen the struggle on the ground by doing our work in places such as the US. I have one quick question sort of to end on. What do you suggest we do Thank you for asking that question. You know, um, um, well, the response that we had from Vanderbilt from the very beginning was uh, quite amazing. You know, it's been a bit of a lonely work to come out and you're going up against some very powerful people. So for the Institute, it has been kind of a lonely work going up against some pretty nefarious but very economically powerful people who are threatening you with lawsuits. So I want to first of all say thank you to all the different people from Vanderbilt who reached out as individual students have finally brought this together. Last week was kind of inspiring. I never expected that from Harvard, but just to see the forces and people who came together and you realize that um, you know the faith and, and the, the future of institutions, educational institutions really depends on students. So there are a couple of things we would ask. One would be if I were a student at Vanderbilt, even if it is about emerging, forget about emerging, the fact that you're trying to invest in a fund because that is promising high returns by investing in agriculture in Africa, it has no business to do that. So one would be to immediately divest wherever you go and invest. You do not go and invest in areas that you do not know anything about to provide the rationale. Do you understand why would you have 20 to 40 percent returns from Africa? Why would our monies be invested there? What is so magical about it? So immediate thing would be divest. Two, it would be to say, make a pledge that you going forward, you would not be investing in funds which given all the approach that's <coughs> around land grabbing, you know, in mining sector, in, in, in uh, agricultural sector, which is happening through private equity and hedge funds, that Vanderbilt should not be investing. In fact, very soon we are working with some groups to launch a campaign to actually say that we as a company, we as a nonprofit, we as a private foundation, we as an educational institution, a pledge that we are not invested in a private equity or hedge fund that is investing in lands in Africa or in other poor countries. And two, we take a pledge that we'll never do so. And I think that should be a clear cut demand for students at Vanderbilt of Matthew Wright. Can I ask another quick question? You mentioned those 30 case studies. Uh, socially responsible investments, which I think are something that we also need to think about and talk about. And what, just briefly, what does that look like? Because I think with that, it is a big endowment and they need to invest it somewhere and I'd like to see them, rather than uh, in, invest it in these land grabs, to invest it in uh, socially responsible um, situations. First of all, in terms of um, 
the 30 case studies, it's a report that has been put out by Harvard G. Buffett Foundation. Um, um, and uh, I can send you the name of it. Um, but it's not a place where you could invest in because there's no money to be made. <laughs> um, one thing that I would say is you might also want to link up with Coalition for Responsible Endowments, yeah. which is a group out of New York, Dan Apfel, and I got to meet with him in Harvard last, you know, that are actually working on how do you do responsible endowment investing. What do you invest in? I mean, I can think of many things. Uh, what would you invest in? Here we are talking about, you know, creating jobs in America, green jobs and all of that. That's a great place for a university endowment to be investing in, whether it is from solar energy or creating jobs within the United States or creating solar panels. I mean, come on, how many of you are planning to know what you're going to do once you graduate? Do we, are we seeing a job out there? For, I mean, the kind of debt that the students have. So it's about really rebuilding our own economy before we start stealing from Africa and other places as well. And the question, what kind of return is sustainable? I mean, I think it's a question that each one of us has to ask. Is it really 20 to, you know, 25 percent returns? Forget about 40 in agriculture, and can they be sustainable? So I think those are the larger philosophical, ethical conversations that need to happen that also make for a secure economic investment, and that is a conversation that needs to start happening. I mean, there's so many opportunities. I mean, Matthew Wright, who could give me great tax advice, is a very smart man. He can. I mean, I think of subjectivity. You know, the company going solar in the Bay Area, they just created 400 jobs, really good, unionized, decent paying jobs. Why aren't private equity hedge funds in, in things like that, which are going to create jobs for, for students of Vanderbilt and elsewhere? Let's start with that. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Take care and thanks again. <laughs> All right, now we're going to uh, just quickly continue with the PowerPoint, and then we're going to have a Q&A um, to kind of continue the discussion that we just started with Anurata. So if you have any other questions, just uh, hold on to them, write them down. The rest of this PowerPoint brings it home to Vanderbilt, so bear with us. It's just a few more slides. Cool. Um, so <coughs> I think uh, what Anurata was talking about is really important, and I think it's also important to place it in the context of other university investments, how Vanderbilt um, very recently refused so accountability in its endowment investments in Darfur, for instance. Uh, that was in 2007. There's a little clipping from the Vanderbilt Hustler. Um, and it mostly rejected responsibility for its, for, you know, what its, endow what its investments were doing in South Africa during apartheid. Um, there's no evidence Vanderbilt pulled, divested any money from South Africa. There was a statement made um, to the to the media, and there were a few sort of gestures, such as this sort of clip here. Vanderbilt will ask the Kimberly Clark Corporation to sign an agreement binding it to minimum desegregation standards uh, for its business in um, apartheid era South Africa. Um, so I think for, for a lot of us, we see like the issue as being of uh, accountability and of a uh, broader issue that. You know that goes that goes beyond um, emergent in both the area of fair food and in the area of accountability in better built endowment. So as this slide says, I think the investment from emergent is a chance to get it right. <laughs> That's where we messed up. Uh, great. So um, this is what you guys can do, like your question was asking, is that we're going to move forward in tomorrow. We've, uh, we have a petition that uh, you guys can sign, and we've had uh, hundreds of signatures already. And we're going to tomorrow uh, uh, march from Kirkland to the Board of Trust meeting and deliver the petition uh, before the meeting starts. So we're not going to interrupt it. That's not our goal. But we're going to deliver it to the people uh, that represent, that represent our investments as the investment uh, sub subcommittee of, in the board of trust. And uh, that's going to be at 2.30 tomorrow. And uh, the petition is uh, for petitioning the board of trust to put something on their uh, agenda, which is our letter, which calls for divestment from emergent as well as um, more effective uh, accountability structure in the
Right, so I mean, this is this is our chance to get it right. This is our chance to actually change the system at Vanderbilt here, not repeat what we did during the part time during the defer, and and make real permanent changes in the way Vanderbilt manages our collective money that we all have a stake in. <coughs> Um, so this is a conversation that's going to continue. Now we're going to do the Q and A, um, but there's also on so tomorrow. Tomorrow at two thirty, uh, some of us and those of you who would like to are meeting in front of Kirkland, and we are going to walk over and deliver the petition. So. Um, just peacefully and quietly deliver the petition, say here it is, um, to the Board of Trust meeting, and that'll be that. So if some of you could sign it, that'd be great. Um, please read it. And uh, also, there, um, another, so other students are going to be hosting a screening of a documentary that talks a little bit about land grabs, and so be on the lookout for that um, coming up on the Facebook page and uh, flyering, etc. And now I'd like to open it up for uh, Q and A. Yes. Um, do we know how significant, uh, like, how much do we know about the size of Vanderbilt's investment relative to our endowment, relative to the rest of the investments in immersion, um, and how secure that is? How much do we know about that? I mean, as far as I know, we don't know anything because Vanderbilt won't tell us. Um, we were, we were. Uh, do you have any more information? Uh, the, the internal documents of the company say that the minimum investing by institutions is five million dollars, um, and Provost McCarthy, in the meeting that we had with him, said that it's, but it's very small. So, uh, so it sounds like Harvard was invested much more because of what Omar said. You know, it's scary that we're going to divest our investment endowment's going to collapse. That's not true. We could, we can definitely divest, and it won't materially affect our endowment. From what Provost McCarthy has said, he said it's very small. Is it, I also think that it's um, more than just, while the numbers are a concern, uh, our endowment is a concern, it's more of the uh, accountability and the transparency that are part of a greater kind of structural issue that is creating these problems and that's causing these conflicts. You, you, you want to follow up? Well, I mean, especially if they're using Vanderbilt's name to give themselves credibility. Um, like Hunter Adam mentioned. Um, what other, is it just Harvard and Vanderbilt that they're using to make their name good? They also mentioned Spellman. Spellman. Okay. Yes? Um, do you have any idea if Vanderbilt is currently investing in any other type of company that would be doing other types of socially irresponsible investments? I wouldn't doubt it, but they are not <laughs> transparent. <laughs> hey, do, you want, do you want to handle this? Or? Yeah, yeah, I can talk about yeah. this. Um, oh, yeah, that's true. There is some uh, corporation in which Vanderbilt is invested that um, some of the workers have called for divestment. Um, it's a hotel real estate company, and they just, um, I mean, I don't think conditions are quite as gross as, as what's happening in this case, but um, the workers at these hotels, at ETI hotels and resorts, are calling for universities um, that have, uh, it has a similar investment strategy of getting universities to be like the primary investors. And they're calling for universities to divest um, <coughs> to support them in um, being able to you know, not have backbreaking workloads as housekeepers, um, not, being, not having to like clean 20 suites a day. Um, I mean, in that case, I was fortunate enough to be able to visit one of these hotels and hear it from the workers themselves. And I think that was just a case because it was a case of, it, it, was, a case, it was another case of investor bragging and um, the, the hotel being in the United States so that students could, from the universities who were investing in the working with that I could visit. So again, going with this larger theme of accountability, we don't find out about these things until someone brags about it, or until a newspaper releases a report. And that's the issue, is that we're not going to find out about anything from Vanderbilt unless it goes public. And that's what we're trying to get at here. Oh, is Vanderbilt so stupid just because it's our policy, or is it also that we have some like legal agreements with these companies that we're investing in? Um, so 
one of you who went to the meeting with Provost McCarty, they, they do have a non-confidentiality, or sorry, confidentiality agreement. That's what we were told. We were told that, now we weren't told what that confidentiality agreement covered. So what the nature of that confidentiality agreement is, what can be said and what can be done. One of the clear things on that is that um, Vanderbilt, if the companies didn't request a confidentiality agreement, Vanderbilt would request it of the companies. Vanderbilt feels um, like um, any disclosure of what they're doing with their money um, is a liability, that any student scrutiny, any faculty scrutiny is inappropriate, and so Vanderbilt is covering itself by having um, non-disclosure agreements, and then when we ask them, they say, our investor requested that we not say. So that's what's happening. Kyle, you want to start? Okay, um, so what are we going to do besides the petition? Like, what do we do after we submit it? Um, what do you what want kind to do? Of action? <laughs> what do I want? Well, um, well, long term, I would love to force universities to um, like show visibility in their investments. Um, I mean, like that's really like long term, long term goal. Um, and <laughs> I guess, like, I mean, just just from like the reaction that we got from HEI when we tried to, um, what's HEI? HEI is a hotel company that we were talking about um, a couple of minutes ago. Yeah. And it also had like, you know, HEI was like mistreating their workers, um, you know, just like the stories um, of like the workers. Um, it's just like atrocious, like it truly is atrocious. Um, but yeah, like, the reaction that Vanderbilt gave when we came and said, um, we have a problem with you investing in HEI, they just, I don't know, they, they just basically, they kind of ignored us. And they also, we received a backlash for, um, you know, bringing this issue. Um, and like in the past, like Vanderbilt has like kind of, made this backlash whenever we criticize its practices. Um, so what I would like to see, like after the petition, is us getting even more people, um, just like making demonstrations, sticking out like a sore thumb in front of, um, you know, like tours and, um, you know, just really being rabble rousers, which we'll, we're already doing, but I would love to see um, it grow to even like larger numbers. I would like to see more cooperative. I think that's rather combative to do that in front of tours. I do, my goal, I guess, would be also for transparency, so I do the same goal as you. I would like to see a greater transparency on a cooperative level, but I think being overly combative is going to again bring backlash. Oh, like when I said like in front of tours, I mean like visibility on campus, like making sure that people know about this. Uh, yeah. Um, thanks for both of your points. I, I would also like to mention that Matthew Wright has agreed to meet with us on in early December um, after multiple attempts since June to meet with him. And it's been a very, very slow process because Vanderbilt has been really, really hesitant to say you can meet with us to talk about it. It's kind of limiting our opportunities for collaborative effort. And so now we're engaged in this longer term campaign. Um, and so we're gonna see what happens with that conversation with Matthew Wright. But I, I agree that at some point you have to start stepping up the stakes for everything <coughs> to get done. Kyle? Yeah, um, in reference to the letter that was sent back to faculty um, and staff, uh, I know that it was marked confidential, but there's no legal, there's no legal protection on that because it's marked confidential. 
it's purely an ethical thing. Um, what I mean, what I, I guess I'm asking you is why were we not presented with that le letter here, or just understanding the content? Because um, I think it's important to know what the university has said to those staff members, even if it's marked confidential. Um, I don't feel comfortable. I've heard. I I, I would ask Leslie Gill. And I would ask her, I don't feel comfortable. Is um, she, t oh, I know this, is she, Leslie Gill, she's tenured, right? No? Yes. She is, okay. I was just. Yeah, and um, and she, and if you told her that you're, and I don't know what she'd say, she might be willing to tell you what was in it. But, uh, yeah, I can't talk about it. I think, I think that some of us have seen her stuff. Um, <coughs> I don't think, I think initially it was a matter of concern that they didn't let us see that letter, but at this point we've had a meeting with Provost McCarty, who we talked at length with him about it, and I don't, I don't think it's very likely that they responded in a more substantial sense than that. I think we addressed that first second as well. So, the, I was one of the signatories is for a few of the people here of the original letter. I didn't get a response back. Um, but after um, spending some time uh, going back and forth with Matthew Wright's assistant, um, finally they said, go ask Leslie for the letter. So I went and, went and uh, checked. I think there's two things. One is that the, uh, yeah, I mean, legally they're not going to like sue well, they can't somebody or something like that for, for showing it, but I mean, I, I do think that it's, it's pretty clear who has more power in the situation if they were um, to uh, uh, discipline someone in any way for that. I think, I think what they had in mind in marking this confidential, I think this like speaks to what the purpose of the confidentiality and non-disclosure agreements is. Right, right. So what, what, what's it? But what's happening when he marks that confidential, what we see happening is that they have a confidentiality agreement with Emergent Asset Management. They break that agreement, and so does Emergent Asset Management, whenever they want, right? Whenever it suits them, whenever they feel like we've pressured them enough that they have to. I mean, that's the reality. Um, what they did there was they felt like they had to respond in some way, but they didn't want to break the agreement, and so they broke confidential, essentially attempting to make us party to the confidentiality, I think. But that's just speculation. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to comment on that question about cooperative versus uh, combative. Uh, I've been uh, maybe not as active as I should have been, but at least I've been an observer and sometimes active in student movements for several years now. And uh, the biggest example I've seen of this, this question was a few years ago when the students were heavily involved in the living wage campaign. The, uh, the lowest wage paid workers in Vanderbilt still are paid less than a living wage. Uh, and their contract gets renegotiated once every, what is it, three years, four years? Uh, three years. And so the last time that uh, they came up for a renegotiation, <coughs> the uh, Vanderbilt Students of Nonviolence made a, uh, a big effort, or was it called Vanderbilt Students of Nonviolence mm -hmm. then? I'm not sure. Uh, I made, I made a big effort to publicize it. And I saw some of what was going on. I saw, uh, first, when they had tried negotiating, tried talking with the uh, Vanderbilt administration, they hadn't, gotten, they hadn't gotten very much progress, and I could see why. The Vanderbilt administrators who were replying, we're not going to change our ways, what they said was essentially, we believe in the way we're doing things. That was roughly... I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, and maybe I'm misrepresenting them, but they said something like, uh, we're paying a even better than what the market would, would give for the wage for these people. We're paying better than the market. So they felt that they were justified by what they were doing. They believed what they were doing was right, and they didn't feel any real urge to listen to any other viewpoint. Uh, but what finally changed their mind, at least to some degree, was when the Vanderbilt Students of Nonviolence started publicizing more openly what was going on, because a lot of students didn't know about the situation, a lot of faculty members didn't know about the situation, a lot of alumni didn't know, and when they heard about it, uh, this started to change some people's impressions, and the, I think that the administration was actually shamed into 
uh, changing their ways a at least a little bit. They didn't want the alumni to know that they were behaving so badly. Now, they didn't actually raise it to a living wage, but they came pretty close. They did raise the lowest paid workers to almost a living wage. And I think that that salary ne renegotiation is coming up again fairly soon. Uh, was it this fall or? Another you know? year. Huh? Another, another year. year. Okay, so I'm expecting we're going to have another campaign like that before long. Uh, but anyway, that was the, the case where I saw this difference between the combative and the cooperative. So I don't think that really decides the issue completely. I don't think they really can completely decide the issue between combative and cooperative. But it, that was what I saw. Thank you. Ben, did you have a question? I was just going to point out that the response that you seem to have gotten from the provost has been very bad. It's been incredibly arrogant um, to tell you that, oh, we don't need an, et an ethical oversight. You know, the grown-ups are taking care of it. The people that are making above a million dollars are taking care of it. Students who go back and, you know, do your homework. It is incredibly arrogant. And I said here, I finished up in May, but one of the last things I was a part of was a, maybe in this room, a forum about the campus in, in Abu Dhabi, and he refused to be videotaped, like showered at people. Um, and I think that marking something con you know, confidential and singling out one person who was an ally of hers, but not the movement, responding directly to her, refusing to deal with you guys, but it's disrespectful. I think it's incredibly disrespectful, and you need to demand more of someone who should their job is to respond to your uh, your demands. I think. What happened in, with Abu Dhabi? Uh, he basically just. No, I mean, what did, what's the outcome? Uh, I mean, they're gonna do it. You know, they had, and then they. No, I, I, I don't think so. They rolled in faculty that are clearly gonna benefit from the project and get promotions from it, and they were all about it, and. Uh, you know, the provost basically like shouted down people that had human rights, con you know, concerns and said they didn't know what they were talking about and they needed to do their homework. And he visited with, uh, with, you know, some Ar Arab prince or something, and he'd heard firsthand that it was going to be a great deal and it was all only going to benefit Vanderbilt. And it's just incredibly arrogant, I think. Does anyone else have questions? Yeah, question. Uh, just out of curiosity, um, I guess apart from the professor that you're working with, um, who was it? Who? Gil. Gil. What other allies do you have um, in terms of like Dr. members? Lots. Yeah. <laughs> and there's, there's a lot of people who signed on to that original letter. How many? There were about 50, I think. Or was it, was it fewer? It was 50, yeah. I think someone posted that letter and the signatures on the website. Yeah. Who's in it? So you can actually read that letter, I think, on our Facebook. Out of curiosity, are these any people who are bringing in research dollars? <laughs> I'm just saying, it's if we're talking about power, I mean, there was one, some there was one professor of neurology who was that was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe tracking more people like that, because I mean, you got to fight sort of power with power, and especially if they do only look at you all as students, which is how they do it. I mean, they see you all here giving an education, benefiting from what they're trying to do. And frankly, they get we're all years. afraid of getting expelled. Like that's the I think that's the unspoken fear of like I don't know, at least if you, if you want to talk about that for me, I'm like getting expelled. Nothing you should worry about that. But I mean other ways to get your voice or align yourself bring more people with it, actually bring money in. I mean that's what they're looking for is bring money in. So if you have people that are threatening they're not threatening in a way, it's like trying to put them in trouble, but yeah, it would definitely help to have That's a great yeah, power. Yeah. So is that Alex? Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, um, I my I have one. My dad is a dean in the medical center. He actually has multi-million dollar drug con contracts with drug companies. And I spoke to him about this tonight. He's very interested in the issue. So that's a good thing. Um, he um, is the dean of faculty affairs actually in the medical center. So he's very interested in learning more. So. Great. I would also say I talked to Trisha the other night down at, at uh, the Occupy Nashville about whether or not y'all reached out to the young alumni trustees. They said that yeah. you had 
and that they said that they didn't have time to meet with you guys. We're actually meeting with them briefly after this meeting. Okay, good. Because so that seems fully totally unacceptable. I've seen interest on the other one. Though. Well, as far as building an ally go, if any of you have suggestions <laughs> as to how we could make this more formal, I know everyone's here tonight because sure they're supportive, or at least willing to learn more. But as far as building a, a coalition of students and faculty and community members, I think that's something that's going to be imperative as we move forward on this. And we do have the petitions, but I do want to encourage you, I'll make a little sheet for people that would like to be invited to follow up meetings um, and that sort of thing, and to be involved in the rest of the campaign. That sheet will be right here, so please do come and write down your information on it. We'll be in touch. Did you have a question? Oh, no, I was just going to point out, I know that we've been focusing on, you know, writing the injustice that we feel as students from being withheld this information, but also, like he mentioned with the workers actually getting higher wages. I think that we should also focus on some kind of remedy that will help the people in Africa who have been directly impacted by this. In fact, their lifestyles completely ruined and changed. So, I mean, it's good that, you know, we'll be able to get more information out to us and know what our school's doing. But I feel like even by my school doing this, I feel somewhat, you know, like, wow, my school played a part in people's lives being ruined. So I think that we should focus on that too and find some type of way to at least slightly help them. That's great. If, if that's it for the questions, then uh, yeah, like Kristen said, if you'd like more info, we have this email list. We have a petition coming around. And uh, once again, tomorrow we're going to meet on the steps of Kirkland at 2.30. And we're just going to gather up all the petitions, all the signatures, and uh, walk up to the Board of Trust meeting of investments that starts at 3 o'clock and just deliver it to them. Just yeah. out of curiosity, like obviously there are, if everyone here, like the number of people who RSVP on Facebook was a lot higher. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to like, I know this is really short notice, but to make this petition more accessible, like maybe have people come at two in front of Kirkland if they want to sign it, so that you're trying to like add as many signatures to like people that are still Yeah, yeah. Well,